What's up YouTube? Today I want to talk about regulating mechanical watches. In the past I did a video on, well, I guess basically a review video on my time graph or machine, uh, which you can probably see in the background over here. Uh, it's currently running, checking the accuracy of one of my Seiko watches. What I want to do today is a little tutorial on how to regulate a 7S26 Seiko watch, or movement, I guess technically. Uh, it's not very difficult. You need a few tools. Number one, a time grapher. I don't know how you would do this without one. I mean, I guess you could over the course of days and days and days of making adjustments and testing, but that would be awful. Honestly, I wouldn't bother. Uh, there are apps that you can put on your smartphones that will kind of substitute the role of a time grapher. I've played around with one or two of those apps and I wasn't overly impressed with them. Suffice to say, I really suggest that you should just go ahead and spend the 100 to $150 on a, I'll call it decent, but it is a very low end time grapher, either made by Weishi or Ace Time Graphers, which just rebrands the Chinese Weishi time grapher. In any event, I highly suggest that you get a time grapher. And then a couple of other basic tools. You're going to need magnification. Uh, I have a little visor that you wear that uh, you tilt down and you can, you know, get different levels of magnification or you could use a jeweler's loop that you kind of hold in your eye. Uh, you know, whatever you want to do in that regard. You'll need a tool to open your case back and then a little tool to adjust the regulator um, I don't even know if the right word would be regulator pins, the arms, they're these little arms around the balance wheel on your watch's movement. I'm just using a little toothpick that I cut down and sanded flat for that purpose. I have in the past done it with a metal pusher like you would use to push out uh, pins from a bracelet when you're resizing a bracelet. I, I don't recommend that in hindsight. Number one, it can scratch up your movement. Not that that really matters. Um, you know, you're not really gonna see it. But number two, it's very easy to slip. And you don't wanna slip, you don't wanna accidentally bump the balance spring on your watch movement, or that could completely muck it all up. Uh, so what we're talking about again, regulating the 7S26, in particular on my SKX009. There's a couple of things that you're gonna wanna do first. Uh, number one, you're gonna wanna just wear the watch for a while, and I recommend Honestly, wearing it every day for about a month. And this is just to let it break in. At that point, you don't even really need to keep track of the accuracy, although it doesn't help, or I'm sorry, it doesn't hurt to get an idea of the kind of accuracy that you're getting during this time frame. But you want to just let the watch run for a while. You want all of those springs to wind up and wind down. You want the lubricants, the oils inside the movement to make sure that they're properly distributed all throughout the working parts. So yeah, wear the watch for a while, at a minimum a couple weeks, and I would even suggest taking it off and letting it completely run down on power reserve and then winding it back up. Why do I recommend this? Well, it's just because you want those springs to get fully wound up and fully unwound and fully wound up and fully unwound. The, uh, the newer a spring, in my experience anyway, not that I'm a watchmaker, so you know, I'm. Don't take this for gospel truth, but in general, springs wear out when they're fully compressed and then fully decompressed, and then fully compressed and fully decompressed. So you wanna get that initial little break-in period of when the spring loses that very top end of its, uh, I don't know, power curve, I guess. Um, you know, just let it break in a little bit. So wear it for a week, take it off for a few days, let it run down, rewind it all the way back up, wear it for another week, let it run down. At that point, you wanna start keeping track of the time. So, accurately to a known time source, I use the website time.is. Go ahead and track your watch every day at the exact same time. Now, it's important that you maintain the exact same uh, wrist habits or wearing habits throughout the course of, uh, of this test. Uh, so, if you put the watch on every day at 8 a.m., then you take the watch every off every night at 8 p.m. Do that every single day. You wanna find out what kind of accuracy the watch keeps on your wrist. Do that for, I would say at a minimum three days, but I would prefer a full week and find an average of how much time your watch gains or loses 
during the course of your norm normal daily wear habits. You also want to be observant of whether or not it's consistent because it's going to be harder to regulate it if it's inconsistent, right? Uh, for example, on Monday you put it on, you start keeping track of the time, it gains five seconds by Tuesday morning when you put it on again. Then the next day it loses three seconds, and then the next day it gains seven seconds. It's going to be difficult to regulate that watch. Probably impossible, if I'm being honest. Maybe a very experienced and talented watchmaker could do it, but you or I, you know, hobbyists, I, I don't think that that's going to happen. But if it is keeping time, not accurately, but precisely, we're talking about precision, uh, that's a good thing. Is it losing 10 seconds every single day, 10, 9, you know, in, in that ballpark consistently every single day? Well, then we can adjust it to keep more accurate time. We have two things that we're talking about here. We're talking about precision and we're talking about accuracy. A watch can be very precise but inaccurate, right? If it's consistently losing 10 seconds a day, that's not particularly accurate, but it's very precise. On the other hand, a watch could be dead on over the course of a week and gain or lose nothing. But on a daily basis, maybe it's up five and then down five and then up five. That's not very precise. So what we really want to find is a precise watch. Whether or not that it's accurate, not entirely important. That's what we're going to fix. So keep track of the precision of your watch over you know, a week would be, my, would be my suggestion. And then from there, we're gonna start throwing it on the time grapher and get an idea of each individual position's accuracy. So let's say, for example, in the case of my SKX009, I wore that watch for about three weeks, probably not a full month, to let it break in a bit. And then on that fourth week, I started keeping track. And I noticed that it's pretty accurately losing, in my case, about 10 seconds per day. All right, so I know I need to uh, adjust it to be closer to, to, you know, plus or minus zero. So now I'm going to put it on my time grapher, which I've already done, and I have all of the uh, results of the time grapher written down here. And I'm going to figure out positionally, uh, you know, what is its accuracy. I'm going to measure it in six different positions, and the, the sixth one probably isn't all of all that particularly important, but uh, dial up, for example, I well, there's a couple of other things we need to know first about our time grapher. We got to set a couple of settings on the time grapher in order to record this data. Uh, most time graphers will automatically detect the beat rate, but if it doesn't, in this case, our 7S26, which is also known as an NH26 movement, has a beat rate of 21,600 vibrations or beats per hour. Uh, we also need to know the lift angle, ideally. It's not 100% critical, but it will give us a more accurate reading as far as amplitude is concerned. In the case of the 7S26 or the NH26, if we look at the technical specifications guide that you can find online through Google, the lift angle is 53 degrees. Other information you might want to know off the top of your head, the base Suggested accuracy for this watch is between minus 20 to plus 40 seconds per day, uh, and the power reserve is 41 hours. While you're wearing it, in particular, you know, I had said take it off and let it completely run down. Good idea to just to check that the power reserve is in fact lasting, in this case, 40 plus hours, just to make sure that you have a properly functioning watch. And we also are going to do all of these checks on the time grapher, more or less to just ensure that the watch is functioning properly before we really go ahead and start adjusting it. We kind of already have a pretty good idea on how much we need to adjust it. In my case, it's losing on average of 10 seconds per day. Uh, but we want to check all of those positions, get readings of the watch's amplitudes and rates and beat errors and all of those positions to get an idea, again, if it's a healthy movement, if it's working correctly. The other thing that we'll look at is on the time grapher, there's a little trace line, and I'll show a close-up picture of it in a little bit. But basically, you have two little lines. Every time the watch ticks and tocks, it goes tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. We want to make sure that the, the trace of those little blips or lines on the uh, time grapher readout screen is uh, not erratic. We don't want like tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. We don't want all this bouncing around and jitter. That would be indicative of a watch that has problems or a movement that has problems. And we don't want to even probably bother regulating that. That's that's a watch that we'd want to send back. As a matter of fact, what, what I do when I first get a new watch is I put it on my time grapher and I 
check it for the health of the movement. I check to make sure that I'm getting good amplitude, that the readout of the graph isn't erratic and jittery. If it is, I'll just send the watch back and return it for a refund or a replacement. So in the case of this uh, little, I don't know, example or exercise, I've already put it on the time graph for once, once when I first got it just to check the movement. Then I wore the watch again for, you know, about several weeks to a month to check the accuracy and to let it break in. And now we're going to put it back on the time grapher again, and we're going to record all of our readings. So now that we know the beat rate is 21.6, and we know that the lift angle is 53 degrees, we're going to put it on the time grapher, and we're going to test it in the following positions. When you set the watch on the time grapher's microphone stand, you can adjust that, rotate it into, you know, more or less any position that you want to. You can do dial up, dial down, Crown up, crown down, crown left, and crown right. Now, crown right is not a particularly important position, and crown up is also not extremely important. A lot of people will rest their watches crown up overnight, so maybe knowing the crown up position would be important if you're the type of person that wants to do that. But otherwise, when you think about crown right, like on my watch that I'm wearing right now, crown right would be me holding my hand in front of my face like this and reading the, the watch. How often... How much time does your watch spend in this position where the 12 o'clock marker is pointing up and the crown is pointing off to the right if you're left-handed? You know, not often. You don't, your watch doesn't spend a lot of time in that position, so you probably could skip that one altogether if you wanted to, but I figure why not just test it? It's not a big deal. Uh, and then same thing, uh, crown, uh, crown up, you know, how often does how often is, is your watch in this position, your, your hand pointing up in the air? Basically never. So that's a, not really a super important position unless you're resting your watch in that orientation overnight. Regardless, we're going to test all six positions, or I did already. As you can see, it's probably running back there behind me. Um, and here's the results that I got. Now, again, keep in mind that the base accuracy of this movement, the 7S26 or the NH26, is minus 20 to plus 40. We already know that on average, on my wrist, on wearing the watch daily, it loses about 10 seconds per day. So theoretically, the watch is keeping good, accurate time vis-a-vis -vis the specifications of the watch. But minus 10 seconds per day for me is borderline acceptable. Um, if I'm going to be honest, I want a watch that's more accurate than that. I prefer a watch that runs fast if it's going to run fast or slow by any significant margin. So ideally, I want to get the watch within plus zero to plus maybe, you know, six seconds. That would be the ideal range for me. That would be within cost specs running a little bit fast. So that's where I would like to get it. So that's what I'm going to try to do. Um, but, you know, what I'm pointing out is keep in mind that if your watch is only running minus 10 and you don't want to do all this yourself and you don't want to buy a time grapher and you don't want to pay somebody to do it, it's in spec. So... You could just live with it. It's not that bad. Uh, but we're going to try to do better uh, because, you know, we're perfectionists, right? So in my testing, and I'm going to read it off my, my list here, in the dial-up position, what am I getting? I'm getting a rate of minus 13 seconds per day. I'm getting an amplitude reading of 270 degrees and a beat error of 0.7 milliseconds. Now, what does all that stuff mean? Obviously, the rate, if I just kept the watch sitting in only the dial up position, it is going to lose 13 seconds a day consistently, more or less. And I say the word consistently with quotes because this movement is not particularly consistent. In the course of testing it on the time grapher, I had to sort of take an average because every 20, 30 seconds or so, the readings were changing, not insignificantly. For example, I chose minus 13 seconds per day as my average dial up rate because it would fluctuate between minus 8 and minus 15 or 16, just back and forth every 20 or 30 seconds. The amplitude would swing up and down a little bit between maybe 270 to 275, down to 265, just not a very consistent movement. The plus side is when we're looking at that trace on the readout, the little graph of the little blips, like I was saying, as the watch is going tick-tock, 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 that's very clean. Uh, so what we can ascertain from that is that the, the mechanism, the pallet forks that are flipping back and forth really fast as the watch is running, that's all working good. But it is 
not super consistent in its rate. What that tells me is I'm not going to be able to probably get this regulated as tightly as I would like, but if nothing else, I'm going to get it to run fast instead of run slow. So that's a win in my book. Uh, now, d dial down. We had a reading of minus 10 seconds per day of a rate, uh, 260 degree amplitude, and a 0.8 millisecond beat error. Uh, in the other positions, crown up, crown down, left and right, I'll just give you the basics. All of them had an amplitude of about 230 degrees. Uh, it, the rate in each of those positions was minus 2, minus 9, minus 8, and minus 3. So crown up and crown right were kind of the best at minus 2 and minus 3. Crown down and crown left were both around minus 8 or minus 9 on average. Now I would let my time grapher run for maybe 5 minutes and I'd keep glancing over at the readout and I had to keep an eye on it and say, okay, it's minus 8 right now, it's minus 10 right now, it's minus 12 right now. And over the course of, you know, a couple minutes, sort of guesstimate what's the average rate there. Because I don't have a particularly sophisticated time grapher, you know, there are better ones that would do much more accurate readouts in this regard. So 230 degree, 230 degree amplitude in all of the hanging positions is pretty, that was all pretty consistent. And the beat error was kind of all over the place at, you know, 0 0.9, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, and then one millisecond even. The amplitudes on Seiko watches can be kind of squirrely. Ideally, you wouldn't, you know, if you had a new Rolex, for example, an amplitude under 270 would be considered bad. But for whatever reason, on Seiko movements in particular, uh, lower amplitude is not uncommon. In the dial up position, laying flat, po the dial pointing up vertically, around 270 is considered pretty good for this movement. So. Keep in mind that if you're ch testing your Seiko 7S26 or 4R36, any of those movements, if the amplitude reading seems a little low, my understanding is that that is not abnormal for Seiko movements. Uh, and then we have, again, the beat errors. Um, beat error is a little difficult to understand. It's the amount of time difference between the balance wheel going tick and tock. Ideally, you want that to be zero milliseconds. You want tick, tock, tick, tock to be right you know, right at zero milliseconds, the same amount of time for the rotation of that balance wheel. In the case of mine, they're all over 0.5 milliseconds or more. So one swing of that balance wheel is longer than the other is what's happening. And we can correct that as well. There's two little struts on the um, balance wheel. What did they call that? Like the bridge or whatever, right at the center of the uh, top of the balance wheel where the little jewel is. One of them will adjust your beat error and one of them will adjust your rate. So first we'll adjust the beat error. We'll try to get that beat error down as close to zero as we can and then we'll then adjust the rate. Now I'm gonna adjust this to the dial up position only. The reason that we're doing it that way is dial up is the position that my watch spends the majority of its time. When I'm not wearing it, it's resting in my watch case dial up. So it's gonna spend Minimum of eight is maybe as much as 12 or 14 hours a day in that position. So that's the position I'm going to try to get closest to plus or minus zero or dead on accurate. I'm also going to try to get the beat error adjusted to the closest of zero milliseconds in that position. Now, since on my wrist, the watch runs roughly minus 10 seconds per day, but on the time grapher dial up, is minus 13 seconds per day, I'm gonna to have to kind of play around with it. You know, you know I'm an, ideally, what am, I, what am I trying to achieve here? I'm trying to achieve a rate that will allow my watch to be as accurate as possible when it's resting dial up in my case and running a little bit fast when it's on my wrist. That's probably what I'm gonna to try to shoot for. Uh, so, we're going to dive into opening up the watch, we're going to look at the different little levers that are inside of the movement there, and you know how, how I'm going to show you how to adjust those to regulate it, and we're going to see what kind of results we get. I'm going to jump over to the tabletop view while we open up the watch, and we'll continue from there. Alright guys, so here's the stuff on the table that you're going to need. Number one, you're going to need your watch, obviously. 
I also recommend that you get some tape. I used electrical tape and then, you know, a little razor blade. And the reason why is to protect the back of your watch's case, I tape it up and then trim off all of the excess with the razor around the edge. That's basically just so that you don't scratch up the case back, which I learned while doing my SKX 007. It's extremely easy to slip and extremely easy to scratch up the stainless steel polished case back, at least in the case of, of, of this watch in particular, the SKX. Whether or not that would apply to all watches, I guess I don't really know, but the case back on this watch is very tight, so it's difficult to, to, to break that seal. Uh, so anyway, I recommend you taping it up. You don't have to. If you don't care about scratches, you can omit that step. Uh, next, you'll need a case back opener, which I have here. This is called the JAXA or JAXA wrench. It's really not the greatest. Uh, the little inserts here that you seat into the, your case back, those kind of, see if I can show you, they, they're, they're kind of wobbly. See that? So you don't really get like a super snug fit while you're trying to spin it, which causes you to have to hold down really, really careful and even pressure while you're loosening up that case back. Uh, watch case holder is a good idea. Here's the toothpick that I use to adjust the regulator pins. I trim off the pointed end and I sand and flattened it down. You're using it more like a pusher, so you, uh, you don't want to risk breaking the tip, you know, you want to cut that tip off in my opinion. Here's my magnifying visor. You'll probably want magnification unless you have really, really good eyesight. And then I just have a pair of latex or rubber gloves so that I don't get my finger oils and whatnot on the inside of the movement. So that's pretty much everything you need to do this other than of course a time grapher. So what we're gonna do is get this case back open, get into the watch itself, and take a look at that. All right, so getting your case back open can be pretty annoying. They're, they're on there very, very tight. You don't have to use this specific tool that I'm using. There's other tools. It's just the one that I have. But getting it sized up on to the case back correctly and using the appropriate amount of pressure, it's, you know, it can be difficult. So I do, again, recommend that you tape up your case back. Now I broke the seal off camera because it was very, very tight, but that's basically, you know, all there is to it. Protect your case back, use a case holder, break that seal and you know, unspin the case back at that point. It's not a big deal. Once we get the case back open, I would set the case back somewhere where it's not going to get dust on it. And then, you know, we're into the movement here. So we'll go ahead and take that out of the case holder and zoom in on the movement. Now I do, do recommend not touching any of these parts with your actual fingers. You know, use gloves or some sort of device but here is the part that we're concerned with, and I'm gonna zoom in even closer here because I don't think that that's quite close enough so that we can get a better look at it. But you can see we have the balance wheel spinning. You can see there's this plus and minus, and I'll use the more pointed end that I still have left on my toothpick. You have the little plus and minus and this little tiny arrow here. What we're gonna do is push this pin left or right to the plus or the minus, in my case, towards the plus side because my watch is running slow. This pin here is the one that will adjust to change the beat rate of the watch. You remember where the beat error, I guess, is technically the right word. If you remember, we had a beat error ranging from about a half a millisecond in certain positions all the way up to one full millisecond. So we're gonna adjust this one first to try to achieve a beat error of as close to zero milliseconds as possible. Once we achieve that, then we'll adjust this one by pushing it left and right. Well, I guess we'll push it this way to move the arrow towards the plus. Very, very tiny amounts of movement on these pins change the amount of uh, results, I guess, for lack of a better word you know, how much of a difference it's going to actually make. 
Anyway, let me zoom in just a hair closer here so we can see this all better. All right, that's about as good as I can get it. So that's what we are gonna be looking at. Now, I want to stress that it is extremely easy to mess up while you're pushing on one of these little pins here and slip and bump your, bump your hairspring, which is spinning on the uh, uh, balance wheel there. So I'm not gonna be able to do this through the viewfinder. I don't have any depth perception when I'm in here on the viewfinder. Um, so I'm gonna have to make the adjustments off camera, I guess. Then we'll put them on my time grapher and see what kind of results we get. But suffice to say, again, you have two little regulator arms or levers. This one here is the one that changes your beat error. So that's the one we're gonna tweak first. The problem with this one is you can see on the one that adjusts your rate, we have a plus or a minus, so we know which direction we wanna push. And this one, we don't know which direction we wanna push. I could push it towards this direction and it might increase my beat error, or I could push it in this direction and it might increase my beat error. I don't know. It's gonna take a little bit of experimentation to figure that out. So anyway, let me try to get the camera situated so that I can look at this through my magnification, but maybe still keep it on screen. I don't think I'm gonna be able to just because of how small everything is. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to try to make some adjustments to the regulator regulator lever that adjusts my beat error, and we'll see what we get. All right, we're going to make a small adjustment to that pin and see if we can get the beat error closer to where we want it. I just pushed it probably too far. I made a very large adjustment there. So we'll throw it on the time grapher and see what we get. I want to show you the time grapher after making my first adjustment. You can see that my beat error now in the dial up position is 2.6 milliseconds. So I went in the wrong direction. I originally had a beat error of 7 milliseconds. Adjusting that beat error substantially and significantly changed the rate, as you can see, <laughs> and we're at negative 70 seconds per day. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to adjust the little regulator pin in the other direction and hopefully get something a little more accurate. All right, guys, after a few adjustments, you can now see in the dial-up position, I have a beat error of 0.1 milliseconds. That's plenty close for me. Of course, you could get it to 0, 0.0, um, but I don't, I don't mind anything. I guess technically the rule of thumb would be plus or minus 5 uh, milliseconds, 0.5 milliseconds. So that's plenty good for me. We can see that there's a few little blips on the readout there that's probably from me talking loudly. But yeah, now I was running negative 13 seconds per day previously. Now I'm at plus nine seconds per day because I just adjusted the beat error regulator arm. So we're gonna slow down our rate adjustment pin to try to get us closer to zero, basically. Uh, so we'll get the watch off of the time grapher and take a look at that. So now that we have our beat error where we want it, adjusting the rate is a lot easier because we know which direction we have to go. In this case, I actually, now that the beat error is adjusted and it's running fast, I need to slow it down just a hair. So I'm going to adjust that pin towards the negative side on the the uh, balance bridge here. You have the plus and the negative. We're going to push the little arrow more towards the negative. Just, just a hair. I don't know if you saw that. My hand was in the way. I suppose it probably was. I got the camera set up all funny. But So we have the plus and the negative on the uh, balance bridge right here. And we're going to push that regulator pin over to towards the negative and try to slow it down slightly. All right, I just gave it a pretty big push. I'm guessing it's not gonna be where I want it. Tiny little adjustments make 
all the difference when we're doing this. But throwing it on the time grapher. Yeah, I'm way, way, way slow now. Negative 41 seconds per day. All right, we moved it back over towards the plus a hair. Gonna throw it on the time grapher and see what we get. All right, you can see we overshot it big time. We're at plus 78 seconds per day, more or less. Uh, plus 78, plus 80. So we're just gonna keep tweaking it until we get it right. Very, very small adjustments make a huge amount of difference, as you can see. Getting this dialed in directly to, or perfectly to, you know, zero seconds per day, it's, it's an exercise in futility. Like, tiniest of little adjustments make tons and tons of difference. Well, after going back and forth about seven or eight times, there's my readout in the dial up position between well, right now it's running at plus two. It was originally at plus six, and it dropped down to plus four, holding pretty good at plus two. Um, have a amplitude of 281 and a beat error of 0.1. You can see it jumped up to plus four there, but this is perfectly acceptable for me. I'm more than happy with that. I'm not gonna push my luck. Uh, so that's where we're gonna seal it up and call it a day basically. I'll test it in the other positions just to see what they're doing but like I said I'm just really concerned about the t dial up position since that's where it's going to spend the majority of its time. Uh, so yeah I'll call this a success. We'll have to of course wear the watch for a little while and see what kind of time it's keeping on the wrist but overall I'm fairly confident that now it's going to be running a little bit fast instead of slow. I have a better beat error. The amplitude actually went up a hair. Uh, overall, yeah, this is looking pretty good. All right, well guys, that's basically all there is to it. It's not too difficult. There's a few things to keep in mind that I didn't mention earlier. Number one, when you take that case back off, I should have pointed it out when I had the watch open, but there's a little black O-ring or gasket. Uh, you wanna not disrupt that. That's what's ensuring your water resistance. Uh, if your watch is not new, I would suggest changing that gasket while you're in there working on it. My watch is only about a month old, uh, so the gasket's pretty fresh. It's probably got plenty of, um, I believe it's like a silicone grease that they put on there, some sort of lubricant. Uh, so I'm not too concerned about it in my case. But if your watch was a year or maybe more, two years, something like that, uh, you know, old, I would definitely consider finding the correct silicone grease and uh, gasket and replacing that while you're in there. Also, when you're screwing your case back down to reseal the case, you wanna make sure that it is tight enough without pinching or kinking that gasket. That could also mess up your water resist. Ultimately, what I would do once you get it put together is find a watch repair shop, maybe a jewelry store in your area that can do a water resist test for you. That's probably gonna be your best bet, just to make sure that the water resistance is still intact after you put it back together. If you don't get your watch wet and you're not worried about it, then you know it's, it's a non-issue. But if you do take your watch in the water, get it wet routinely, definitely keep in mind that you've opened the case so you could be compromising the water resistance. Other than that, like I said, it's not too difficult. You need a few tools to get into the watch. You need ideally the time grapher, potentially you could use phone apps. I again will reiterate, doing it without the time grapher, number one, if you nudge that regulating pin to correct the beat error. I mean, you wouldn't even know what your beat error was without the time grapher. But if you nudged that pin, you're, you're gonna have a extremely difficult time getting it accurate. And even the smallest, slightest of movements on the pin that controls the rate can swing the accuracy over a minute per day. I just don't see how you would dial it in very accurately without a time grapher, at a minimum one of those phone apps that people use to check the accuracy of their watches. So, you know, spend the money. If this is something that you're gonna do routinely, if you, if you collect a lot of Seiko watches, I believe the movement on an Orient watch works the same way. 
uh, and you're going to want to self, you know, regulate them yourself, go ahead and spend the money. I think it's worth it. Uh, regulating ETA movements is slightly different. I've never done that. It has a very small, fine adjustment screw on it. I don't know exactly how that works, but in you know, principle and theory, it should all basically be the same. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to give you guys a look at how I regulate my watches, in particular my Seiko watches, whether it's the 7S26 or 25, whether it's the 4R series of movements, or whether it's the 6R series, they all work the same way. So it's not very hard. You don't really need to be afraid to get in there as long as you're careful. Probably the biggest error you can make, like I had mentioned, is slipping off of that pin and bumping your hairspring and getting that hairspring tangled up. I did do that once and I didn't know how to fix it. So that watch is just in the junk drawer until maybe I replaced the movement entirely. I don't, it was a cheap Seiko 5 watch. It was, you know, whatever, 70, 80 bucks, something like that. So I'm not super worried about it. But my point is that if you tangle up that hairspring, the watch won't work correctly. At a minimum, you'd have to take the balance out and untangle it, potentially replace the entire movement. You know, I'm not sure how, how you would handle it, but be careful when you're adjusting those pins. It's not hard if you, again, you use a toothpick like I did, cut the tip off and make a nice smooth flat surface to use to push those pins back and forth. You shouldn't have any problems. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I know it's run pretty long. It's probably over a half an hour long by now, but I wanted to be completely thorough and share every piece of information that I could with you so that you can go into this project yourself feeling confident. Uh, so yeah, hopefully you enjoyed it. If so, give me a thumbs up, you know, like this video, share it. Uh, of course, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I do new watch related content on probably a, more, th more than once a week. <laughs> I was gonna say a weekly basis, but probably more than once a week. I come out with new videos, be it reviews or tutorials, things like this, all kinds of stuff. And uh, if you want to help support the channel in any way, down in the notes section or the description of this video, there's a list of ways you can support the channel. Uh, you can also find that in the YouTube's About page. I really appreciate all the support that I get from guys that send me watches for review on loan, for you guys that are Patreon supporters, for people that send me emails and donations via my PayPal link. All of that means the world to me. So thanks again for checking out this video. I hope it was useful, and we will be back in a few days with another review video. Bye now.